Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Florian Schlosser. I've hopefully I've pronounced that right. Was that yes. right? Good. Great. Right. Richard Miller put an, an L at the end of it. He said it's Schlossler. <laughs> 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 it's not the way it's spelled. <laughs> um, and uh, Florian is speaking to me from Mallorca, Spain, a beautiful island where I once spent a happy month uh, doing long meditations in 1971, 72. Um, yeah, it was. Delightful place. Uh, they do all their construction in the winter time, so we usually meditated to the sound of jackhammers outside the window. <laughs> That's true. Uh, they're, not, they're not allowed to construct anything. Anymore. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Very peaceful. Now. Yeah. Um, and uh, Florian will explain what he teaches and all in the process of this interview and who he is and, and his background and so on. But um, I wanted to just start by asking a perhaps trivial question. Um, I, I was listening to a, a talk you gave a couple of years ago at the Science and Non-Duality Conference, and you used the last name Tatagata or something like that. I was wondering yeah. what, what that is and why you don't use it anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, this in, in the spiritual world, many people, they have uh, spiritual names. Or so that was like spiritual your spiritual names. name. It was one. I had a, a bunch. Okay. And it was like the last one, <laughs> which comes actually from the, the Buddhist tradition. Oh, okay. And uh, its meaning is, as far as I, uh, I, I know, it means uh, he who walks on the right path. Huh. But somehow, over the last few years, I just could really resonate with me to to expose the name. It has a meaning inside, in a way. Yeah. So I'm carrying it internally, but there's no need for me to to first of all show it to the outside. And second, I have been noticing that when I started to share meetings, I still uh, uh, called them satsang, and then there was satsang and tatagata, <laughs> and satsang with tatagata in, in in only three words, two words. Most people didn't understand what 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 I, what I'm talking about. So right. there was so much need to explain myself all the time. Just create an obstacle. Why yeah, why should I make it more complicated than it actually is? So I removed satsang, call it meetings, remove the name Tatagata, call my name Florian, makes it very easy. <laughs> People understand what I'm talking about. So, you know, I, I love to simplify and bring it down to scratch. And so basically that's the reason why I'm not using that name. I was actually quite uh, surprised that they put it on the DVD of the Sand oh, I see. Uh, 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 compilation, Yeah. but I think I, I asked them this year not to do it. Okay, good. I, I got a spiritual name one time too from Ama, the Hugging Saint, but I, I, mm. can't, I couldn't imagine myself running around you know, town here calling myself Umesh. So <laughs> yes, I, I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I notice on the wall behind you, you have pictures of Ramana Maharshi and Papaji and Muktananda. Were they all teachers of yours, or at least yeah. uh, you know yeah. Ramana? You probably your lives didn't yeah. overlap, but but I, I I spent quite a bit of time around uh, Muktananda. I, I, I lived in India in the ashram for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So uh, Muktananda was a kind of my like sort of my my real Indian guru, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I also would say that the way he was expressing and teaching in a way has has a particular impact on the way I'm I'm sharing what I need to share so it's a it's an interesting combination of what Rama is representing to me and on the other hand what Muktananda uh, rep represents and maybe we, in the course of our conversation we're going to maybe clarify a little bit what I mean exactly so yeah I'd like to do that I mean, some people, when you ask questions about this sort of thing, they say, oh, that's just a story, that's just my past and all. But, you know, yeah. the people we studied with, it has an influence on us, and it has an influence on the way we express ourselves and so on. So it's kind of interesting to know what a person's background is. I mean, on, on an intellectual level, it's true, you know. It, mm -hmm. All this is past, and it is a memory in, in our brains, including the experience with Muktananda and then with uh, Isaac, who was with Papaji. You know, all this is basically intellectual mm -hmm. uh, memory, but... There's another aspect that I very much like to include in this, that there are different other levels of memory and div different other other levels of how our system accumulates experience. Yeah. And I would call it more that the body also records energetic impact. So if you have been around a person for a while, the mind may forget about the pictures and the actual experiences, but the body and the nervous system and the cells, they still keep on remembering. So depending on the intensity of the experience or how close we have been with something, we almost 
become that experience on a cellular level. And to get rid of this, I mean, we can say it's all a story in our head. This is easy to forgotten. But the, the body remembers pretty much everything we ever went through. And if we want to go further than this, we our body has memory of millions of years of human history in us. So mm. it's, a, it's a very complex... Um, arrangement that we're dealing with so just putting it on it's only a story sounds a bit superficial to me actually yeah it, it does and it's interesting because uh, some people say that it's if you're with a teacher it's not so much what the teacher says but just the, the sort of the presence or the transmission of the teacher uh, is the thing that really affects some sort of significant development in you and I, I, uh, you know I, I, perhaps that takes place on a cellular level I, I would even go further I would mm -hmm. say the teacher's impact is not so much the teacher or what the teacher has to offer it's more about how your system is capable to absorb that information yeah so I mean you can talk to me and if I'm not open if, if there's no interest in me to what you offer or what you speak and it doesn't matter if it is spiritual or worldly or mundane or whatever to the degree there's interest in this system the system will automatically like drink it it will absorb it on pretty much every level of experience mm -hmm. and if that openness or that interest isn't there you can offer whatever you want there will be no connection happening in which this transmission let's say or this dynamic it's more for me it's not so more a tr transmission because transmission normally would imply that there's one source transmitting something to another to somebody else mm -hmm. but for me it's more like an exchange like when two systems connect this and like a chemistry, there's a dynamic happening, and in, to the degree we can be close to each other and trust each other, in that chemistry, in that dynamic, information starts to exchange. And that's, in my experience, more accurate than one transmitting something to somebody else. Mm -hmm. No, very good point. <clears throat> so it, it, what, 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 it, what, it, what, it, what it actually points at is that there is always, an, it, there's always a connection and to the degree we are able to give ourselves to that connection, okay, or to honor that connection, to that very degree exchange is happening. And doesn't and again, and that is not spiritual or limited down to spiritual experiences, but it is basically I mean, if I look into my marriage or to my friendships, I mean to the very degree my system is capable to to be intimate, to be close, and inviting the other person into that same closeness. It's a very a very deep connection and a very transcendental experience independently of the state of consciousness of somebody isn't yeah. it i don't know how, no i think it's true I, you know to whatever extent we are receptive to whatever extent we attune to the person we're with whether it's a guru or our spouse or exactly. the person at the checkout line in the supermarket you know exactly. <laughs> there's a communion <laughs> and there's a sharing absolutely. yeah absolutely and that is not that's not a personal sharing it's not like uh, a personality Florian connects with a personality Rick or whoever, let's call it like this, but it is, if, if we really take a moment in tuning into what's happening, we can, in that, in that kind of presence, we can literally feel how our nervous systems, our energies, our body connect. Even though you are thousands of kilometers away right now in, in America and I'm in Europe, we, we, we we, we start to connect. It's like mm -hmm. not not consciously. It's not something we do, or there is something that we need to do for. It's like we're just feeling comfortable with each other. We get to know each other. Yeah. It's, it's a bit smoother, smooth, and suddenly we can relax. And in that relaxing into the bodies, our 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 let's say the energy or whatever you call it. It's just words I'm using now. Starts to dance underneath the level of our conversation. I don't know if if. If you're up to stuff like this, but no, I, yeah, yeah, I'm. Just, I'm, I'm very into <laughs> really experiencing our conversation on 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 multi levels, mm -hmm. not only on the intellectual level, but what's happening energetically at the same time while we're talking. That's right. quite, quite cool, actually. It kind of reminds me of that poem. I think it was by John Donne, where he said, "No man is an island." You know, it's a very yes. fam famous line. And you know, yes. we appear to be these discrete, separate, isolated islands, so to speak, but we're really all kind of the underlying ocean <laughs> the islands are just sort of apparent outcroppings but if we're looking at separation it's interesting what you say rick because i mean it it's it's a it's a common a common saying in the spiritual world that it's called a separation and non-separation non-oneness oneness non-duality duality, non -duality. <coughs> but let, let, let's 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 take a moment and clarify what we're talking about because i think there's a lot of 
mysticism around this whole thing of separation and it's mm -hmm. in my experience and as far as I have been exploring with them which is not finished yet there's there's an interesting aspect that is so simple that we very easily can overlook the fact so if we if just for one just instant okay we're here now you over there wherever that is I'm here and so there are different when we're looking at how separation functions then we have to take a look into how attention functions, how uh, the movement of our focus, okay, focus <clears throat> functions. So normally, focus and attention for me is one. So we can, if you look at attention, we can focus attention onto something, like onto each other or onto something inside or onto an object outside. And we can vary that, we can, we can play with the different focuses. So we can have a narrow focus. Okay. So in the moment we're focusing like on our heads, like only on the sound of our voices and the eyes that look at each other, there will be a pretty pretty much exclusion of the rest of our system, which is naturally. So it's like a zoom, okay? So we zoom in, and then we're meeting here. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, it feels like something's missing, okay? I mean, we're having a connection on that level, but where's the rest? So we just start to just relax the focus a moment. Like like this and including the whole body okay or let's let's start with including only the upper upper part of the body until the belly button sure and people listening can do this too even though it's not live yeah. you know they can it's, do this so mm -hmm. take a moment now mm -hmm. and just relax the focus a little like a muscle okay mm -hmm. not holding it tight like concentrating or trying to figure out what we're talking about it just relaxing from yes exactly and then being aware of Oh, we're already sensing more. Huh? We are more. We are aware of more. Simply, we could say. You know, it's not even a somebody sensing. Suddenly, there's m more showing up on the screen of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, only because, like in the theater, when we zoom out, like from the spotlight to the floodlight, suddenly we see not only the 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 the, the, pr the protagonist on the on the stage, but suddenly we see a little more of the stage. And if we keep on doing this, we're just relaxing the focus even more our body will appear in it. Okay, this body that's called Florian, the body that calls Rick or whoever listens to this, suddenly we'll, we start to be aware of, huh, whoa, 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 there, there was more happening simultaneously while we're talking. And funny enough, as we're letting the focus relax, it's like we're, let's say, let's zoom, let, let, let the focus zoom out infinitely to the ultimate opening, which would be dropping back into consciousness, okay? In, in India, they would call it maybe the drop returns to the ocean, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the limited focus returns to the wide focus, okay? We're seeing that in that wider focus, there's a, we include the system like fully, or at least a little bit more than before. Mm -hmm. And just noticing what effect that has on the sense of separation. Mm -hmm. Does it feel exactly as separated as before, <clears throat> or does it feel less separated? But what would you say? It's interesting. Oh, yeah, I would say less, sure. Yeah. Okay, so, so separation has nothing to do with separating from the outside, right. which is like, but it is how the focus separates itself from mm -hmm. the totality of the experience of now, which is happening in this nervous system. It's happening in, you know? Yeah. Now, you're not saying that focus is a bad thing, are you? No. Because it's necessary. I mean, if you're an airline pilot landing a 747 in a snowstorm or you're a brain surgeon in the midst of a 10-hour operation, you have to really focus or, or lives are going to be lost, you know? And uh, so it's, focus is necessary. What you're saying, though, is that it can become uh, overbearing or, or if, that, if all our life consists of is, is one is a sequence of focuses without recourse to unboundedness then we're then we've got a problem is that what you're saying uh, we have to there are a few distinctions that that I think are very useful for everyone to to play with this so first of all it's totally clear it's not about a wrong focus or a good focus okay mm -hmm. so basically what we're talking about including the whole pro, pro so-called incident or process of, of awakening is nothing else but a different quality of focus it's a different sh it's a shift of focus okay right so, okay so but but let's let's have a have a l there are a few distinctions that i think are very useful so number one it's very useful to be able to focus when we have to perform something like you said the pilot or when we cut vegetables you know if we're not focused we're going to cut off fingers off okay so right. that's pretty much practical and this and is not bothering us because i would say it's totally natural you know it's like a capacity that our system has naturally 
to perform action to mm -hmm. to make sure that the system survives. Yeah. Basically, that's it's a survival mechanism on a very healthy rudimentary organization in our in our organ in our nervous system. But then what happens that in the course of our life, for most of us, we're undergoing in experiences where um, this natural capacity to focus when it's needed and to relax again when there's no need to focus gets lost. Yeah. Okay? So that's Already. very, very important because there's a lot of confusion around this that's going to show up much later, including the whole spiritual search. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we could call those experiences experiences of um, overwhelm. Okay? Mm -hmm. What is an overwhelm? Too much information comes in and the system cannot cope with that information anymore. So right. imagining you are a child and you see your your parents fighting, okay? Mm -hmm. Loud and yelling and all the rest of it. And the, and and your nervous system just has a tremendous impact of aggression, sadness, sound, energy, and the system has no way to differentiate, to distinguish and to cope with that. That energy will be experienced as an overwhelm, as an invasion. Yeah, Can and if, if we want to talk of fight flight, we can't do either of those under that circumstance exactly. either. So and we just have to sort of internalize it. Okay. So so what happens in this moment of overwhelm that the system moves from like a kind of aliveness, relaxed state into a survival mode. Mm -hmm. What is survival? A, v a very strong tightening up in the system and a very strong tightening of the focus, trying to identify where the threat is and trying to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's too much. It's simply there is it's just too much. So it's an automatic biological reaction of the system that pulls the system tight, including it tightens up the focus. Mm -hmm. So what happens in these moments if if, if this let's call them traumatic experience. I don't like that word very much because it is so psychologically charged, but I would call let's call them overwhelm experiences. Experiences um, that Okay, simply like this. Even traumatic. I mean, you think of the soldiers in Iraq and yes. Afghanistan these yes. days all coming home with uh, PTSD. Um, exactly. Post-traumatic so stress what happens disorder. When, the, when these experiences are not completed, when in the moment they're happening, it's like the experience is like it's relaxed, there's a threat, there's an overwhelm, which is a high level of energy in the system trying to cope with that experience. And if this experience would just be completed naturally, it would just relax again and life would move on smoothly. But mm -hmm. many of us, I would say pretty much every human being, has underwent experience where this normal amplitude of the experience has been interrupted. That means yeah. smooth, and suddenly, in that high peak of energy of defense and shock and fear, the system uh, doesn't know what to do. It doesn't, it doesn't discharge that energy anymore, and it freezes in. It freezes in into a kind of unnatural alert state, mm -hmm. which he, Alertness means an unnatural state of focusing. Yeah, and the stuff you're saying is actually, you know, there are physiologists who talk about this, you know. Yes, biologists. And, 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 yeah, biologists. very detailed terms, and they work out the biochemistry of it and everything. The, the, the system stays in this sort of unnatural and inappropriate agitation agitation yeah it's agitation it is an unnatural vigilance mm -hmm. that that makes the system alert right okay? it, it feels alert but it it is fear driven it is actually panic driven yeah so now it ha what happens is that the system freezes in into a very high level of energy and doesn't know how to relax anymore mm. so what happens now is if this is happening it habituates it habituates, it perpetuates right. all the time, mm -hmm. and later on, it, it feels awake. The, dif the difficulty is it feels awake. It feels even more awake than others. Mm -hmm. But what is it is comes from a, a, a pushed dynamic in the nervous system that where the system constantly looks for threat, it starts to observe like an animal that has been hunted. Maybe you have seen this on on uh, Discovery Channel. You sure. know, when like a deer was hunted, and yeah. it's like it's like it's like driven. So what happens later on, that under these circumstances, there it's possible that through additional impact, the system activates that hyper alertness and ha can have experiences awakening of awakening. It's like because the system just like doesn't know how to cope with this anymore, so there is a high tendency to disembody. Hmm. 
So you're saying that these traumatic uh, experiences can actually be triggers for awakening or, or they can, they catalysts? Can be, they can be, be triggers for a confused understanding of awakening, let's call it like this, because it feels awake. Oh. The difficulty is that... So it's not awakening in the spiritual sense, it's more just a hyperactivity kind of a, you know, a, a, it can, too, it too can, much adrenaline or something kind it, of... It, 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 the system is on a, let's say, let, let's return to that to the basics, okay? So once the system hasn't discharged that stress energy, the system is locked in into a state of hypervigilance, okay? Mm -hmm. Of unnatural alertness, which is showing up as stress, speed, mm -hmm. lots of thinking, right. yet a very high capacity to observe. Mm -hmm. because it's, it's the fear, it's like the, the deer under threat observes its environment and in, inside, outside, inside, like a relay, like in, out, in, out, in, out, on a very, very, very high frequency, mm -hmm. and it feels like conscious. The difficulty is that this consciousness is quite narrow, yeah. and the system cannot relax in that, because the system is still suggesting that there is a threat going on. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, even in the state of alertness and, uh, and wakefulness, all the defenses in the system are still activated. Right. The defenses means, means fight, attack, flight, when, it's, when there's too much information coming in, or freezing in into a kind of numb state which is still conscious but it doesn't feel much. In my language, we would call we, or in psychologists they would maybe call it diso a dissociated state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, when we walking down the road of spirituality, and we start to learn meditations, for example, which is like in the beginning that you observe yourself. For people who have been traumatized, these practices are relatively easy because they're observing themselves all the time anyway. Hmm. So now, when there's a spirit layer of explanation on top of it, what remains unconscious is all these disintegrated layers of dysfunctionality in our system that drives the system to these states. What happens is the more that we are going down that road, the system disconnects from its own origin, from the, from the valley where it comes from including the pain and the, the, the traumatization or the thing, and claims transcendental, trans, that it transcended it, mm -hmm. the difficulty. And, and what happens is in that moment, we disconnect from our bodies, we disconnect from the nervous system. I call it, we disembody. Mm. So there is, there is a state of awakening, there is a state of wakefulness, of consciousness, but it has no link to the actuality of what's happening in the in the human system. It is dissociated. Mm -hmm. And I've seen over the last 10 years a lot of people with, a, with profound experiences um, of seeing, okay, of like opening up. Right. The difficulty that I, that I have been noticing is that only a very limited amount of nervous system have the capacity to, to handle this, to, ho to hold it, because it slips through. To embody it. To embody it. Right. Beca because what means embodiment? Body means means that your consciousness returns into your body. That's it, it's about embodiment. Consciousness drops into the body, includes the body again. The difficulty is that once this, this is happening, on that descent of consciousness into the body, the, we are starting to notice and realize all these things that have been driving the system out of the body, mm. trying to get away, trying to transcend the experience because it is too painful. And for many people, this is so shocking that after this, like opening up and say, say, uh, how is that possible that everything that was underneath suddenly showed up like like a like a volcano on the screen of consciousness, which mm -hmm. all the things that have been disintegrated, let's say yeah. traumatization, the stress, the fears, the defenses, and there's a very high tendency in this let's say called non-duality business to deny that. Huh. To, so to you kind of to keep pushing it away or to something. Use, to use the teaching is not real. It's, mm -hmm. this, is not, this is not true or this is not, experience is not real. As the ultimate promise, as the ultimate exit to never a again dealing with what's 
mm. what happened and what has been disintegrated, what is still dissociated in the system. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a tragedy, but it is also ruining the, the bliss game, I call it. <laughs> because, I mean, hanging out in that spade and, and, and to disembody, and it's, it's very beautiful not to cope with this. The difficulty is the moment we are touching life on a very normal basis, like in our relationships, in our jobs, in the, where we relate with other people, because this is where life happens. In that moment, all these little things that are still unconscious and that there are distant, they are touched all the time. Yeah, yeah. All the time. They're triggered. Bam, 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 bam. And if we don't know about this, and if we don't know what, what is triggered, it is not the personality, it's not the ego that is triggered, that is absolute garbage it is disintegrated organization in our nervous system where the system hasn't has lost its capacity to to breathe in and breathe out in a natural way in connecting with life and disconnecting again from life like sleeping being awake breathing in and breathing out so that's why i've been noticing that many spiritual seekers or people who have been even finding whatever they have found the way their system is in life is is confused. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments on that and then get your response. Um, yes. Well, as, as you may know, in many cases, uh, meditation techniques of various sorts have been used to sort of deal with soldiers that have PTSD or with it's taught in prisons and things like that, people under stressful circumstances, often with very great benefit. Um, so... You know, there's that, but I, I have seen the, the same phenomenon you describe, which is where, you know, awakening is used as a sort of a hiding place or a refuge yes. at, and, and to the neglect of the physical. And uh, there's an interesting thing you brought up, which is I think that, you, you know, what you were saying is people will have this awakening and then all of a sudden all this stuff that they didn't realize was there starts to percolate, starts to be, you know, starts to, they, become, they start to become aware of it. And I think that too is a natural process. It's like nature wants to do house cleaning when we have the capacity to do it. In other words, once the once the broader awareness has been established, then it's a natural function of the body just in the you know, with recourse to that to begin to resolve stuff that needs resolving. But what what you further said was that uh people often recoil from that and use an intellectual sort of game of, oh, this is not real, or this is just an illusion, or this is just a story, to try to avoid the natural process that is attempting to take place. And there are t people out there, in fact, I spoke with one last night, I did an interview with a guy who's in this group called Waking Down and Mutuality, who are very aware of this process and have the express intention of coming into the body and you know and so sort of waking down as they call it and dealing with the stuff that they have this thing they call the, the wake down shake down which is that very often when an awakening takes place then you know the shit starts to hit the fan and then it must happen like this i mean ultimately we have to understand how that whole process functions you know in the moment c c what is the awakening awakening is a shift of attention for right. one instant, the focus of attention is withdrawn from objects and experience towards that which is aware of the experience. All mm -hmm. that, in that moment, all this is awakening. There's nothing else but this. It's a recognition of that which sees the experience instead of being focused on the experience itself. So it's a 180-degree yeah. shift of focus. That's all what awakening is. Everything else is blah, blah. <laughs> so we have to make that really clear. Yeah. The thing is that naturally, that shift of focus is like a, it's like a, how would say, like a breathing in and breathing out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as long as there is stuff incomplete in our system, okay, as long as there are or in, disintegrated or dissociated, call it whatever you want. Let's call it incomplete. Okay. Things okay. that we are not in peace with. Right. What happens, and, we and, and I just and I might say also physiological correlates to those things. In other words, it's, at, at the cellular level, in the, in, the, in the chemistry, in the, in the yeah, all that stuff. The psyche itself is a product of disintegrated stuff in the nervous system. Right, the psyche to, is a construct. Okay? Correlated. It's correlated. Okay. Right. So, in the, so as long as there are un incompletenesses in our system, even though that shift had happened, it doesn't establish. Yeah. Okay. So something pulls it back 
And instead of people saying, well, it's your ego, just keep on focusing on awareness and all the rest of it. I mean, I know people who are suggesting this yeah. on, a, on a serious level, say just keep on exp just focusing on, on, on uh, awareness and the rest is going to be solved. First of all, it's a doing. Mm -hmm. Because as long as the focus is not establishing itself in, in, in consciousness, you have to do it all the time. Mm. So you have to take the focus, will shift it willingly, and play with that whole Ramana stuff, you know, who is aware of these questions, you know, it's all tricks. I call them tricks. Yeah. They have an effect. The problem is they only have an effect as long as we play with that stuff. Right. So I'm suggesting for one instant, stop using any trick. Don't even use Ramana and Papaji and all the questions and who am I. Just remove that tricks from your library for a moment and just be aware of what the focus is doing naturally. Mm -hmm. Does it return because it wants to deal with stuff or does it naturally abide? Yeah. And there will be moments where it will be abiding because it's nothing to do because it feels complete, it feels in peace. But in the moment you're relating, for example, you will very quickly see if there's anything, for example, in your marriage. And, and if you now allow the focus to j jump out mm -hmm. and take notice of what is triggered and you're not using a trick to return it back to, to awareness, you start to see things that you have never, ever seen in your life before about yourself. Yeah. And that is so shocking. And that is so, it's natural. It is non-invasive. It is a non-doing because you allow the focus to move naturally instead of using tricks. Exactly. But then, you, but then you will also see all the places where the system will still respond habitually, automatically, which is basically based on disintegrated um, overwhelm. Let's call it like this. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Ram Dass uh, famously said that if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your parents. Uh, yeah, or be married. Be a married man. Like <laughs> exactly. I am. Clear yeah. Reflect on a daily basis. Yeah. How 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 much resting there is really? If your focus can abide mm -hmm. there, if you can rest, or if 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 it is just takes an instant and you, and it's triggered, and it's not that you are triggered. We have to dis again distinguish this. No one is triggered. It is that the focus <laughs> swaps out back to the experience, not because it is wrong. It is because there is something to get. There's something to to explore, mm -hmm. and if you f if you're using a trick to to prohibit this or to say, hey, well, I just I'm consciousness. I'm not dealing with this anymore. You gotta use your willpower for this, and that is you. And it's unnatural. I would like to suggest that, um, based on what you just said, that you know, genuine awakening. If we want to, you know if I can use those terms, is not something you have to be vigilant about all day long. It, it, once it's really established, it's natural. And you don't have to play little mind games to, to kind of retain it. In fact, there's this verse in the Gita. It says, uh, creatures act according to their own nature. What can restraint accomplish? And, it, you know, uh, it, 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 there's a sort of a, you know, and you see that, it, I think, in, in really awakened people, if you've hung around them, you know, if you hung around Muktananda or, or Papaji or whatever, they're not like, you know, wrestling with inside their heads all day long to maintain some state of awareness. They don't care. It's, no, it's a complete, natural, spontaneous, yeah. uh, they're established in that state. They don't have to, to, to do things to, to they, maintain they hold, it. The whole, the whole in, in my own experience, the whole pressure, the whole idea of, re of needing to remain conscious drops from the system. Yeah. So it's like it includes moments where it feels like the system is unconscious mm -hmm. it's like uh, there is no involvement even in that process so because there is not such a thing than unconscious it's 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 garbage unconscious means that the focus of attention is not abiding in consciousness anymore but has naturally returned to an experience where there is exploration happening because there's interest I mean, if you're not interested to, li to live, let's say, a happy life or to have a happy relationship, then you won't be interested to explore what makes you unhappy in a relationship. Okay, right. no problem. But for me, I feel interested because for me, life is like there's so many aspects of life. And as long as I feel like I, I, I'm not really comfortable in a certain field, I don't have to experience everything. But if I feel like it's not, it's like I cannot relax there, it's always naturally that my attention moves there and starts to explore and say, what's going on there? Okay. Yeah. So in that moment, we are giving that space or we are the space even for that 
interest, that, that exploration, without any concept in between, not the teaching, no Rama, no Krishnamurti, no, nothing, there will be, naturally there will be an exploration happening when it's happening. Mm -hmm. And when it's finished, it's like a cat, I don't know if you've ever, they come home. Yeah. They've explored their thing, and the, and, and the focus returns and abides again. Say, ah, oh, work done. It's not you working, it's like attention works and for you. It's like it works for you. Mm -hmm. You may have heard that story that Eckhart Tolle tells about where he was watching some ducks on a pond and the ducks got into a fight and there was all yeah. this excitement and then after a few moments the ducks just swam off a little bit, shook their feathers and then yeah, just calmed yeah. down and that was the end of it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then whatever has been seen and explored and felt and somehow allowed to be there, we could call it psychologically, in Western terms, we would call it, it integrates itself or it finds its place in our nervous system where it can just rest. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's more language, like we drink it, we can, instead of needing to defend and push away. So even those tricks using this, I mean, that sound really lovely, those questions and just focus on awareness, but ultimately, if you really look, they have a seat of not wanting to deal with life. Mm. I like the fact that you refer to the nervous system a lot because it's my understanding that um, you know all this, these words we use, enlightenment, awakening, and all that stuff, it very much has a, a physiological component or counterpart. And um, in, in fact, that one thing I haven't heard, I've listened to quite a few hours of, of you in preparation for this interview, and one thing I haven't heard you say too much, and maybe you can discuss it, is that um, ultimately, I believe, uh, a, a physiological state can be cultured over time in which um, this sort of uh, broad awareness, or whatever we want to call it, is spontaneously maintained in the midst of sharp focus. So that, the, so that it's not a seesaw kind of situation, either or situation, but even while focusing sharply, broad awareness is, without trying to do anything, it's spontaneously uh, maintained by virtue of a, f a style of physiology that has developed an to enable that to occur. And uh, I, then, I, 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 then the focus doesn't have the same kind of um, yes, overshadowing grip, uh, grip, grip that it yes. used to. Yeah, beautiful. And and I just recently discovered something that I like to share with you. So it's like uh, latest research. So <laughs> okay, breaking news. <laughs> breaking news that uh, just revealed in the last couple of weeks, and uh -huh. that's why maybe I've never really talked about it. Okay. And um, it's it's uh, it's fascinating actually. So we have to. Maybe we can approach this whole that what you was uh, the question or that uh, issue or that whole subject by um, the whole through connecting. What mean? What does it mean to connect? Or and how does connection function? And connect with need, what other people? With or? everything, just connection. So the feeling okay. of being connected. Uh -huh. Okay, you know this feeling to be connected. Yeah, I think because so. we have this feeling to be like a like an island. Uh -huh. and then we know this feeling of being connected, not with somebody, uh, I see. Or with, but it's like we feel like, wow, this, this, this yeah. is me. Like, it's like a feeling of connection, and I don't want to put too much spiritual stuff on top of it. Like, I, get, I get what you're saying. Okay, so like a belly connection. Now you meet yeah. somebody and say, I have something in common with you. I have mm -hmm. something in common with life. You know, Affinity, with maybe. Like, like a dance. Right. Okay, so, okay. okay. So, and we have to, again, go back to this kind of disintegrate because in that moment of overwhelm what happens is that the system disconnects mm -hmm. it disconnects internally right and what happens on the nerve on the level of the nervous system that uh, neuronal structures rudimentary you don't have to uh, worry about that wire by the way just let it hang it's, okay it's not, so it's not, so it's it's not hurting wait. anything so <laughs> so there are two ways so first of all we have to go back to the very early experiences of our life for example when we leave the body of our moms mm -hmm. And the way we grew up, I was born in the 60s, it was very uncommon what people used to call mother-child bonding uh -huh. these days. You know, they take the kid away and put him in an incubator. Yeah. For, yeah. For, for, or for 30 minutes, clean it up, wrap it up, and give it back to the mother. Right. And in those 30 minutes, there was no connection. You know? yeah. And they found out only in the late 70s about this whole uh, uh, impact that m child mother bonding has in the first two to three minutes of, of the body not being in the body of the mother anymore, of the body of ah, child. It means yeah. that in these rudimentary minutes of life, essential existential neuropathways 
are established in the system of how the system experiences connection or disconnection. I'll be darned. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's fragments of, of, of a t time span, like minutes, and that's mm -hmm. why they're taking care these days that, that the child is put on the chest of the mother mm -hmm. even before they're doing anything so that the nervous system immediately bonds, connects again with the, with the warmth and the vibration and the energy of the mother. Yeah. So it has an effect on how the neural pathways in the brain, in the nervous system are established. So the way we grew up, but most people grew up, especially when you look into the generations of spiritual seekers, we grew up in a way where birth was completely different and actually quite brutal and cruel, the way they, we have been, our mothers gave birth, because yeah. they, for, for about, for my case, for about 30 minutes, there was no connection. So what happens, that the system, internally, on the level of the nervous system, has no blueprint, it has not learned to connect. It is navigating like it wants to connect because it's natural, but it doesn't know how to connect. So there's a lot of confusion around this. So that's one aspect. So then through the experiences that we talked about later, it builds up a kind of connection with life based on its capacity. But then when these overwhelm experiences come, and this doesn't mean much from the perspective of a child, even these very fragile and rudimentary connections can easily be disconnected again. It's like the system moves from its rudimentary association to dissociation, what means mm -hmm. neural connections are destroyed through energetic impact. People so know. they don't have the strength that they would have if the kid were allowed to be with the yeah. mother immediately. So yeah. now we have two factors, and now imagining these systems start to go out now and trying to connect. So mm -hmm. if we look for that first, I mean, most spiritual people begin with trying to find connection with a partner, with sexuality, with doing a job, and when they see that's not bringing happiness, then they hear about enlightenment and think, oh, let's go for this. It's going to unify me again. It's going to bring me oneness. Oneness mm -hmm. is I feel connected. Huh? That's what it is. Yeah. If I feel one, I feel connected. It's just another word for it. The thing is, that that's not happening, because inside the system doesn't know how to connect with itself. So it constantly mm. looks for its own reconnection, or let's say reintegration. Mm. So the spirituality that we are drawn to is very often a disembodied spirituality. So mm. when, you, when we look into the Indian culture, for example, I was living in India for many, many years, and yeah. again and again I returned. Only very, very, very many later, many, many years later, I realized how disembodied the spirituality is that comes from India. Hmm. So most of our contemporary spirituality, including Advaita, is originated in India. Yeah. But India is a very disembodied country. That's why the, India looks like a dead body, <laughs> because the body is considered dirty, to be avoided, sexuality, sensuality, it's something that is really like, I mean, you, you hardly can touch people in India. Yeah, so, if somebody accidentally touches you, they, they do all this apologetic stuff. And, uh, and also, I mean, there's the actual scriptures which go on and on about how the body is all full of worms and feces and urine and, and all the rest of it. So there's all, they yes, try to make it as disgusting as possible to, to disassociate you. It's a, it's a cultural perspective on the human body. So now yeah. the spirituality that has been promoted and developed there, and it is in its seed, in its origin, Indian. We have to understand this. We, ex we have imported this into the West, and the promise is that we just don't have to deal with that stuff. But we're functioning, first of all, we're functioning completely different. Mm. And second, if we don't include all the levels that I have been talking about and also our understanding because we have been in the West we have been evolving as a species we have found out about the nervous system we have found out how impact the birth has and how the relationship between the parents and the child built, uh, uh, determines how our system how healthy our system develops all this knowledge is I understand understand very often excluded from this kind of non-dual teachings hmm. uh, and and we return to some stuff that is basically Indian and it in, in India it means it completely uh, uh, neglects the body as as part of the experience and that's why I understand that so many people are confused because we live here we deal with this every day and then we have that concept in our head that somehow tells us something different so we don't get this together so it's a it's it's a very 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 
serious or let's say a very useful distinction that we cannot just take this philosophy or this perspective and import it into the West and say that's the way it works because there are la layers and levels in our nervous system that doesn't understand that, you know, it, there's no comprehension for disembodiment because we don't live there, we come from another cultural background. Hmm. So I think it's very important to take this into the big picture of what we're talking about. Does it I make think sense? perhaps a lot of, yeah, sure, I think perhaps a lot of that talk uh, of, you know, the disgusting nature of the body and all in India was intended to break the sort of initial infatuation with the body with its beauty and you know with its pleasures and all that as, as it, you know for for people for whom all of that was the you know predominant reality but i don't know if it was meant as a sort of an end teaching that one should always hang on to you know i mean, cuz as as you say you have to you may have a disembodied awakening but you have to come back into the body after that and if that is clear if if for i mean for me it's totally clear that that if you have an understanding of this, and right. if you are prepared, and if you after you have your honeymoon, your I call it the honeymoon with consciousness, and you have yeah. your honeymoon, I had my honeymoon too. Mm -hmm. Reality knocks on the door, yeah, and it knocks on the door with the very basics of life. You know, you have to earn your money, and you have your marriage, or you have to a relationship, your family, mm -hmm. and if you if you're not using all this as a concept to get away from it, you start to instead of coping with life you you let life in hmm. you you integrate life but yeah. it's not that you integrate something external you start to integrate all the places where the system has lost its capacity to be in life to be with life to drink life mm -hmm. so you know and i bet you when you do this um you could speak from your own experience you find that you have a lot more energy because a lot of energy is is sort of consumed in trying to keep life at arm's length, and once you don't do that anymore, that energy can be freed up for. But there's a, there's a, there's an interesting intermediate step in this, mm -hmm. which is also people don't know much about it. Mm -hmm. So, so when you have an understanding of, of of consciousness and who you are, then, like we said, life doesn't get you away normally with this. So it will is it is behind you and it will keep reminding you that there's still there's more integration. there's yeah. more to it's deepening is wants to happen deepening yeah. deepening integration call it like this deepening mm -hmm. I call deepening okay so and in the beginning because you are just in so much in love with that bliss you just try to get rid of it at any cost you just push everything away saying no I don't want to deal with that stuff because I'm done right. I'm done okay which is the mind claiming a state. But which is not a state. So now this, like you said, this costs energy. That costs you a lot of energy to keep life out because you have to. You're defending. You're defending a state. Right. The sense. What happens is that the mind now identifies with nothingness. It says, "I'm nothing." But that is the identification with nothingness, and it, it protects itself from everything. It says, "I'm nothing, and I don't want to deal with everything," which is life. Okay. Right. And that costs energy. And if you're very lucky, there will be a moment coming where you will be very, very exhausted. Huh. And I have been noticing in traveling around the world, including my own experience, if you live like this and holding on to that kind of state or in that into that quality, let's call, for me it's not a state but it's a quality, the system gets drained. Yeah. It can't. It, there's a moment when you get really exhausted. Underneath the bliss, underneath the claim, underneath the teachings, and underneath all that stuff, you know, even people prostrating in front of you, and I tell you this from, 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 from what I do in life, so to say, underneath there's accumulating exhaustion hmm. because the system still defends and it uses even this teaching and being a teacher and all that stuff as a subtle way to keep life away from yourself because there is still no rest. So before the full impact of life can come in, like you said, like energy, in a sweet way, like not in an overwhelmed way, but as like a, as a kiss. Natural flow. Like a natural flow. We have to allow the system to come to this place of exhaustion. It almost feels a little bit like a collapse. Do we have to go that route or that's just one way it could happen? I mean, I don't know if we have to go this way. Maybe people can avoid but that. But I can see, look, 
look, I, I think it's, it's a little bit... A few days ago, I read an interesting passage in a book. I'm not reading much, but I just opened that book because I had a little health issue, and I said, ah, let's, let's check this out. And, and I read something interesting and, and related it to myself. And what it said, that, our, that in our life span, up to the middle of our life, around the mid-40s, our system, our body and energy system, is um, equipped with a natural amount of adrenaline, which masculine energy is, mm -hmm. which is an energy that pushes the system to survive. It pushes the system to make something out of your life, to get a training, to get a job, to establish a career. It, you need will. You need that adrenaline. But that amount of adrenaline, of male energy, uh, slows down and empties itself. It's like it's only you like mean, a quantity. Do you mean testosterone or you mean adrenaline? No, adrenaline. It's a, it's a Because women have cocktail. adrenal glands too, you know. Yeah, but it's a hormonal cocktail. It, women have that same, yes. Mm -hmm. But it's a certain amount we have. And obviously that comes to an end, that resource around the mid of our life, which is actually good because normally when life moves normally, in, in the mid of our life we have established ourselves, we have the job, we have found our place in the world. Let's say normal, just basically, no matter what you do, so you don't need that energy anymore, and suddenly life offers different other qualities. For example, instead of fighting yourself through and using your willpower, you can rest and you let life in, you drink it, which is more like a feminine energy. It's like mm -hmm. receiving life, okay? And it was very interesting when I read this, that it, again, we were talking about biology, that the body is equipped with a certain amount which is necessary to, to cope with life. It's incredible intelligent, but it is not there forever. So right. in the middle of our life, you know, that's why elderly people start to relax a little more. So now, if you look at the different uh, generations of non-dual teachers out there, there are some, let's say, very young ones, and they are very enthusiastic. They have that full yeah. power of adrenaline, you know. Like and Pantino. I For example, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's just like energy, 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 but there is so much power. You have quite a bit so of energy yourself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You must be young. <laughs> no, I'm not so young. I'm <laughs> I know. So, um, when this, so you see that energy still plays, but I can notice when over the, the last few years, and especially in the last few months, I could notice that this exhaustion underneath, it's like the system's reorganizing. It is literally transforming itself from do it to pushing from from not resting even this to a kind of natural quality of rest mm -hmm. but in, in and i've been talking to many many hundreds of people in the last two three years and i've been i was wondering so many people are exhausted and yeah. i could notice that they come with the same thing that underneath the whole bliss stuff take the whole philosophy away there's tiredness in the system it's like, hey, it, and it's not because they're doing wrong. It's just because the system still hadn't, has fully, in, has not fully integrated and learned the capacity to, to drink life, to, to enjoy. Let's call it to enjoy, not enjoy with a smile and jumping around. It's like I'm, you know, not this kind of enjoyment. It's like an inner. It's like drinking a nice, sweet, good wine. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you sit down and you just enjoy because there is a sense of knowing that you already are connected mm. because this adrenaline has to do with connection the system f tries to connect and there's a funny assumption in the system that it is not connected yet but there is a place in our system where we already know that we are connected and it's something we can feel in our belly I would say I, if I would locate it it's like in the lower part of my body it's like, and if we just honor that place, the system can just hang out in that place of connectiveness, even, now we come to the, your question, in moments when discomfort happens, when focus is demanded, when conflict arises and all the rest, we don't have to leave that place of connection, let's call it. And it's, yeah. and I tried a lot, I mean, really, uh, Rick, and you cannot do this. And no philosophy can provide this. This is literally a natural maturing process that is 
is that you cannot speed up. My really? So, so, yours, so your experience is that you just have to wait till you get older. Now, what about you know, a meditation practice where you might be in your 20s, but you have cultured the practice of meditation and you can sit for an hour in a deeply restful state? I mean, wouldn't that sort of inculcate uh, the kind of um, more settled style of functioning that you're talking how about? Long, how, long, how long does it last? Well, if it's a good type of practice, I would imagine that it doesn't just stay there while you're meditating, but it has lingering effects if you're doing it regularly. It lasts 24 hours a day. Okay, you know? are, we talking, are we talking about lingering effects or are we talking about the natural state? Natural state. I, okay, pers okay, that's personally. A, that's a, yeah, that's a little distinction. I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, uh, making joke or mm -hmm. making fun of you. It's just like... I understand what you're say, saying, and I understand that sincere meditation practices and are have have an effect, and they have depending on on how serious they are and how clean they are. Yeah, they have and it's not just a psychological; effect. It, it alters no, no, the physiology no, no. in a way, in a permanent way, which you know runs twenty four seven. Yeah, I mean, I have been meditating many years way ahead, mm -hmm. but I've been noticing that. The natural maturity that's going to be an element too no matter is, what i mean is is not to be accomplished by any means yeah there's certain a certain dimension of our ch of the changes we go through only has to do with age and not and again it's depending on what our culture i mean look even it's funny enough we live in a culture where winners yeah we, you know so a young man who has woken up and now teaches he's a winner Mm -hmm. And he has a lot of energy, people seeing his energy, people who have maybe 50, 60 years and say, wow, look at this energy. So they, they get a little bit of his energy, but it's all bored and it is, mm -hmm. it's still part of our culture. Mm -hmm. And I think we have lost this beauty of ordinariness, of allowing to be tired, to be not great, to not to be glory, not to be the winner. I don't say that we're losers, but it's like, you know, it's so easy to be blinded by, by even this, you know, and if, 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 if the guys are looking good and, and having a good sense of humor, I mean, we're just like, we're like this, but it pulls our attention out there. Yeah. Instead of noticing sweetly and beautifully and consciously what's happening inside, because it's so, it's like if you watch George Clooney on the on the on the on the catwalk, I mean, it's like wow. I mean, he's so charming, and then you see one of those young, lovely, awakened guys. You know, I mean, they're just like wow. It's like Superman. Okay, I'm Superman. But wait, 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 wait. This is not reality. This is, this is. There's so much still, uh, still to happen in life, and we don't, we don't know this. So it's just like I don't know how you are. You're also a little older than I am, probably. Mm -hmm, I'm 62. That, yeah. So, so I don't know. It's like when you look at this stuff, it's sweet. I enjoy. I'm so happy for for everyone. But also, like inside, you say, oh, okay, don't take it too serious. You know, just yeah. don't take that too serious. You know, it's gonna change. Life is gonna change that whole play. It just takes a couple of years and another crisis and a little thing and it's here, and then we're gonna see how how the whole thing is gonna be. But people yeah. are so they they love they love the winners. Huh? <laughs> well, sure. Look at our culture. I mean, we all get yeah. we get all excited about what these movie stars are doing and everything. Yeah, and so yeah. now we have a new a new a new species of winners. We call <laughs> them the spiritual winners. They made it. They got it, but they didn't get anything. They they, they all that happened was a shift of focus, a realization, mm -hmm. and a way of ahead of front of all of us of integration of things that our system is carrying in the cells. Yeah. I like to think we're all in the same boat, and yeah. uh, you know, maybe sometimes people wander to the front of the boat, and sometimes people are in the back of the boat. But the, basically, they're all in the same putt spot in the ocean, you know, just kind of moving along together. And also, and I, I mean, different strokes for different folks. I notice you're a musician there. You got some guitars. That's an old line from Sly and the Family Stone. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know. If someone is attracted to one of these charismatic young teachers and wants to sit what with them, and yeah, great. It's it, it, and as no, you say, no, no, life not, goes through phases. We'll see what they're doing twenty years from not, now. It's but nothing, it's yeah, it's nothing, you know, it's nothing wrong. And I, I please forgive me because I'm, you know, I, I I it's lovely to see. I I can see there's there's a there's a a potential for for seduction. Mm -hmm. 
and there's a potential for guru worship and you know just yeah. you know and then and it can work both ways i mean that can not only and, and, you know, sort of be it's, and and we all have to make make our learnings and 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 it's not about right or wrong for me it's like it's about honoring reality and we yeah. have there's a reality of consciousness this is the ultimate reality there's consciousness here and that is that which sees and includes everything and then there's a human reality we call it the embodied reality the nervous system it's bio the biology the biology the bi biological reality mm -hmm. which is complex and and it has an effect on how our thinking functions it has an effect our psyche is organized it has an effect of how healthy we are dealing with life it, uh, and that can for my in my experience cannot be denied if right. they're walking hand in hand I would say life is like a rhythm between knowing, like what Ramana says, I know that I'm nothing. Okay, that is like the ultimate reality that Ramana represents. It's like mm -hmm. there's consciousness as the ultimate reality, and nothing is real. Right. And then there was the 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 invitation of uh, Muktananda. If I just take my own journey, mm -hmm. and he he said, I'm everything. Mm -hmm. All of this, the whole universe is is an experience in my own system. Yeah. And I can sense this, and somehow. They are the same. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, in my nervous system, I, I it's like there's this reality that Ramana represents, and then there is this drinking of life, this drinking of energy that Muktananda was representing, like Shakti. Both at, he called. Both at the same time. And they're and they're walking. It's not even say they're walking hand in hand. They are not to be separated from each other. Yeah. They, they are one. And so it's just for me, I need to do effort to separate one from the other. To say mm -hmm. either to only play with energy, then I would lose myself. I wouldn't be no rest. And if I would only be resting without drinking, uh, there would be, God would not be recognized in, in, in all of existence. So so I think this, this kind of... Um, it's a dance. Yeah, no, I, I get you. Yeah, it's, it's a it's paradoxical, but that's the way life is. It's both and. There's in Vedic physiology actually. There's this thing about there being you know, two nervous systems or two aspects of the nervous system, and uh, you know, it can develop to the to, to, so where one aspect of the nervous system is maintaining that sort of I am nothing state, while the other aspect of the nervous system is simultaneously maintaining the I am everything state and you know the engagement in life state. And then these two things kind of go on simultaneously by virtue of those two functions. I don't think it's a type of physiology that Western Western physiologists would acknowledge. But, but, they, but they, I mean, if you if you look in how Western uh, uh, neurologists they would call it, they would call it the parasympathicus and the sympathicus nervous yeah, system. Yeah, maybe so. Oh, yeah. So the parasympathetic nervous system is that organization of the system where the system abides and rests naturally. It's like when mm -hmm. we sleep. The system yeah. moves from activation into rest. And mm -hmm. the sympathetic nervous system is that nervous system that makes the system move, active, mm -hmm. that allows us to be in life and do the things that we need to do. And it, ideally, the system has found its rhythm or has never lost its rhythm so that these two organizations in the nervous system can swing like a pendulum so I pretty much what you say yeah and, but like based on what we were talking before that natural self-regulation or call it self-balancing this capacity we most of us lost so we need to use tricks <laughs> techniques methods teachers energies to trying to return to that balance the difficulty is that the system can only return naturally to that balance yeah. because it no, it has that capacity already so you know as a matter of fact we have to sooner or later it's disappointing to remove the tricks all of them including non-duality it's beautiful but it is often used as a trick yeah Although I would suggest that a good teacher could offer you, I don't know if he, we would use the word tricks, but could offer you te methods or something that would be natural, that you wouldn't say were unnatural, but that can help to inculcate this the sort of style of functioning you're you're alluding to. Um, so it's not like I would toss all the teachers out the window. No, and, no, no, uh, no, 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 no. It's not the teacher. It is what the system does with the teacher. Yeah, yeah. The teacher can be a trick or it can be a, a pointer or an invitation. It's, right. it's Nothing needs to be thrown out the window. It's to, to be honest to oneself and to see how am I using all this. 
Yeah. Because let, you can let use me ask everything. You a, yeah, please. Let me ask you a question um, that would bring us to the practical application of everything you're saying. Let, let's say that um, you were hired by the U.S. Army to come over to Afghanistan and to deal with soldiers who are under tremendous amount of stress and they're, you know, they're traumatized by the, the fighting they've been involved in. And the Army says, you know, this is, this is a problem. These guys are committing suicide. They're killing each other. They're going home and beating up their families or becoming alcoholics. We want you to help these guys you know, de-stress and, uh, you know, decondition from the, the intense situation they've been through. What, what would you do for people like that? Very simple. Uh -huh. I mean, the first thing I would, I would introduce, and it's very simple, you know, just making them realize that prior to all the experiences they're undergoing, the fear, the stress, the disintegration, the panic, there's no awareness of all of this. And how would you make them realize that? And I would just ask them a bunch of questions, you know? Mm -hmm. Is it possible that you see their thinking? And we would say, of course I can, I'm, I'm conscious of my thinking. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you conscious of the panic in your system? Yes, I'm conscious, because otherwise, how, how could they tell me? Yeah. Are you conscious of the vibrations in your nervous system? Because stress is a high level of agitation, of activation in the nervous system. They would normally ask, of course, be, and very simple, because if they would not be aware of it, they wouldn't be able to talk to me about it. Okay, so that simple fact that they can tell me about it must uh, 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 is a proof that there, there is something aware of it prior to their capacity to talk to me. So and then they say, oh, so that awareness is who we are. So that which is prior to integration and disintegration. It is prior to stress and relaxation. So because these are states of activation in, in 80 millions of cells. That's what, what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a biology, we're dealing with a physical experience, with a, or call it a somatic experience. I think it's a better word. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, when you, when you, as we're here now, okay, just let, let, imagine you're one of those soldiers, or I'm one of those soldiers, okay? So take a moment, so there's awareness here, and see if we can just be conscious of the different qualities that are in our nervous systems right now. Okay, some of them are relaxed, feet are on the ground, we can feel a little tension in the shoulders, and <laughs> some energy flowing through the arms, energy is quite moving, but there's a connection with the belly. Flora and I just had a, a brief interruption, computer glitch, and uh, had to restart my computer, took a moment to feed the cat and go to the bathroom, and now we're back, and uh, I'm going to just ask Florian to resume where he left off. So we're playing with that idea of that we meet somebody, what I say, soldier of the U.S. Army being highly stressed, and what would I tell him? Okay, that was the question. Yeah, and you were leading and through I mean, a procedure that you would take him through, you know, to... Yeah, I would, I would just, yeah, so starting with, the, with inviting that person to realize that there's awareness here, and that this awareness that is prior to even the stress and the excitement and the activation in the system is the ultimate reality is who he is, consciousness, which is very simple. It's a very easy distinction. People making a huge fuss out of this, but with a bunch of interesting, simple questions, it, people realize this in a glance. It's nothing big. And have it, you actually done this with people who are really tightly wound, you know, who are yeah, on the verge of, of suicide on a, or on a, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis? Deep I'm, depression, that kind I'm of sharing. thing. Yes, I'm sharing, I mean, also like when I'm not traveling, I'm sharing, sharing Skype sessions with people around the world, people with mm -hmm. a lot of symptoms or with, with different le le levels uh -huh. of disintegration, including people who have been on the spiritual journey for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm privileged to meet them and, and play with them and, and explore this together. Some of them have realized this awareness as the ultimate reality already which is not necessarily causing like like stars sh showing up for some it is a very exciting experience for yeah. others it's a very calm very smooth very natural realization that doesn't have a lot of impact what's yeah. much and i don't want to underestimate that realization but i also don't want to give it too much significance because that's not the end of the story so when i would right. now meet those people or whoever 
with the same symptoms that doesn't necessarily need to be a soldier because a lot of people have that symptoms mm. i would i would invite them to as step number one simple to take a moment now as we hear there's awareness here and just taking a moment just slowing down the time because there's a capacity in us to literally slow down inside because there's so much speed and being aware of the speed and the activation and if you can feel like I would talk to you now as if you would be that person we're just allowing the focus of our attention to relax for a moment like a muscle that we were holding tight for years for 20 30 40 years because we were so scared we give it a moment of letting the focus relax like you know you're tired you come home and say what a day <laughs> enough for today okay and then you just let the focus hang hang let it hang loose like this and noticing just the invitation has an e effect on how the stream of energy starts to flow differently you can feel like there's a little tickling in the legs and mm -hmm. it's like oh okay like and in that moment, you can feel the underlying tiredness. Can you feel it? Like it's behind the eyes. It lives there. Because we and we just give it space. Okay, we we allow it. We fully give that space because this is the most precious we have now to slow down. Because what we're used to to push over, to kick it, and to keep going. Because this kind, it's like it feels like if I would let go now, if I would really surrender to the exhaustion, my heart, I, everything we're going to break down. It's like, it's like it scares the, the worst out of us. Mm -hmm. But interesting wise, when we honor this, that this is an underlying reality in most of us, and don't underestimate that, Rick. It don't matter how shiny and bright we are on the surface, and I include myself into this. This is not the actual reality. In most of us, and I would say 99% of all cases, and I have seen teachers, students, on various levels when I meet them like this and we just take a moment this is felt because the system they're still are we as a species we all are still running more or less on a survival mode hmm. we could call it even a spiritual survival mode so this Advaita non-duality stuff is very often another loop in our survival ma ma machinery hmm. we're trying to survive literally emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, but many people also surviving like worldly, like, I mean, this is a survival mechanism, okay? Okay, so when you say 99% so, of the people, what you're refer referring to is that 99% um, have this sort of inner agitation or um, dis uh, disruption or upheaval or something going on beneath the surface. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Okay. To, to varying degrees, obviously. Some people, to various degrees. Some people and huge, and some people minimal, but you're saying there's always some. And, and tremendous capacity to compensate. Hmm. So, I mean, the tricks and the ways our system compensates not to deal with this hmm. are unbelievable. And I tell you this from a perspective of what people call a teacher. I'm not referring to myself as this. This is a super high developed compensation because it can be used for this if you're not taking care of what's actually happening inside of you you mean being a teacher is a super for example it, it can be a, it, it's the ultimate compensation mm -hmm. not because you're because you know you're exposed people come to you. there's a lot of energy playing with you yeah. you're giving energy people give you a lot of energy mm -hmm. so it it builds up a certain let's say an artificial reality in your own nervous system that creates a feeling of aliveness yeah. that probably is not your own aliveness. Mm -hmm. It's oh, a pushed I, aliveness. Yeah. I taught meditation is, for 25 years, and yes, when you're up you know in front what? of a crowd of 100 people, and they're asking you questions, and you're really on the stage, on, and you, know, you, you really wake up, yeah. <laughs> and, and you wake up, and you wake up together, because, I mean, there's so much play of energy happening that, I mean, you have to have 100 people in a retreat, and people, for five days, they give you attention, because that's what they're coming for. Because yeah, it's a real high. It's a, it's a high, but it, su it suggests to your system aliveness which probably or in my experience and I'm just speaking very openly mm -hmm. because I'm from time to time just taking breaks and I want to see what the actual reality is and it's interesting to see that there's a lot of bored aliveness yeah 
and underneath the system is still trying to survive even that energetic impact because you're imagining it copes with its own experience now there's so much energy coming in from the outside now it has to cope with that energy too and the system just is just breaking down regularly in a way mm. so to to be able to as we're speaking now it's interesting our the way we are sensing now it's quite amazing we're talking but there's a different quality of how aware we are inside do you noticing this mm -hmm. there's like we are we're taking care of that subtle it's like a, like a tiredness and I'm using words now but it, it has an effect that we're more gentle can you notice it's like it slows down it's like we give more breaks and we can track more mm -hmm. it's like we're connecting deeper with with what's actually true in us and I'm talking not about the ultimate truth that we are awareness we have had this before but there's an inner reality of this organism called Rick the inner organization of, of the nervous system called Florian and this is so often denied and not because we're, we're because nobody has invited us I mean nobody has introduced to us a way to meet this to let's say to welcome it to to drink it what we're actually dealing with on a daily basis hmm. and uh, interesting wise I've been meeting some colleagues some teachers and I've been had the luck to meet them privately, and it's quite interesting when they're not in stage like me or having an interview. It's very different, and so I, I'm happy to to also not to promote this now that because you said before you also have a lot of energy. On the one hand, it's true, but it's it's only one part of the game. Yeah. This, how 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 is that now? So, like we were talking about these people, can we can we invite this kind of receptive gentle quality or let's call it like a kind of non-pushed energy it's, it's less energetic it feels less bright it maybe feels often maybe even less enlightened or whatever you call this but how 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 can we describe this how would you say what are um, we talking you mean right now how would we describe it yeah um or how do we connect what's the what effect does it have on our of the energy field that we're creating right now together you and me well, I'm I'm not complete. I'm not sure I completely understand your question. But when I when I do an interview like this, um, I find it it's sort of like the old teaching days in terms of a real high of energy. But it's also it's very refining and um, it has a it's sort of like your your whole system kind of becomes more finely attuned or more subtle yes. in in its functioning and. Um, and it's, and for you me, know, it's like it's interesting. There's it creates space. Yeah. There's suddenly there's a space between over there and here in which life can happen in exploration. Right. Maybe even the people who who are listening or who will see the interview, they will feel like, ah, oh, there's more space now to to be, to rest. And that's yeah. what my how I feel it right now. It's interesting. Well, your your whole thing that you started out talking about about you know shifting from the tight focus to the sort yes. of more relaxed, broad. You know, I think it, when you have your attention on something like this, it has that effect. It sort of like, you know, loosens the grip of the type focus and and sort of relaxes you into a broader kind of uh, state. Um, but can you well, notice what what the, what what it has an effect? This widening of the focus has an effect of how the body reorganizes. Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. The body uh, follows the focus. Mm -hmm. It becomes as if more. Um, Coherent in its functioning yeah, or something, or yeah. transparent, or or yeah. like almost like it expands a little bit, as if the cells or the system would have space to breathe, to to be. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that uh, the, that the, the experience we're having is following the focus, obviously. Mm. One one doubt that I have that I want to raise is um, go ahead. I wonder about the um, potency of what you're doing or what you're saying, because you know, like as we've discussed earlier. There are many, many layers of conditioning, some of which started in our infancy. And uh, some of these people I've been talking about who are highly stressed, you know, uh, like if you went over to Afghanistan to do this counseling, um, would you really be able to, you know, relax them through very many layers or would you just be kind of scratching the surface since no, it's, no. It's, it's built course, up so powerfully course, yes. and then yes. they've got to go out and fight again you know so what yeah. how can this help them not get as stressed the next time they have to go out and fight I mean I mean first of all it's true this is we're not talking about the quick fix okay? right okay not at all okay so I have to be honest and I mean I'm, I'm 
I'm in that field for 25 years now. In the last 11 years, I was more inviting people from here, from consciousness, instead mm -hmm. of from fixing. But anyway, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of potential for integration or healing still there. Which so, could go on for years. In my experience, it is... A lifetime. Never ending. Right, right. The, d the deepening or the healing or the integration or the, dis the embodiment, I don't see an end to this. If people claim it's done, okay, I, it's it's a it's a, it's a valuable perspective, but it's not my experience. I would I would not sign this. So I think it's I good would... to be clear about that because otherwise people have false expectations, you know, yes. uh, or either they kind of fool themselves into thinking they are done, or they they feel bad because they feel like, hey, I'm not done and I should be or something. But well, if you <laughs> if you realize that it's an ongoing I, process, of doneness of doneness is so confusing. Because having a lot of energy doesn't mean that you're integrated. Right. Uh, uh, being bright and smart doesn't mean you're integrated. Even being awakened doesn't mean that you're integrated. Yeah. It has nothing to do with each other. I mean, these are completely two different realms. To be grounded or integrated is another way to say, to be able to be connected without doing connection, without doing actively connecting, is something that is completely different than knowing that your consciousness. I mean, these are two different worlds. Yeah. And I think it's very, very clear to, to let people know that there's a long journey, depending mm. on this history of w that body, of, of meeting things in the system, that once you have seen them, you, you, you will very clearly know who has ruled the, the energy in your house. You know, even the, the drive to teach or the drive to share or to be bright and to let people know what you have found. I mean, there's so many things in the background that are still like the remote control. So to be honest, uh, um, if I would meet those guys in Afghanistan, that would take time. Yeah. So a very huge factor on that journey is time. Yeah. And obviously you're just one man and you can't um, sit and meet with, you know, millions of people in the world. But um, so do you have something that you say to people that would just enable them to do this on their own without you, you know? I mean, the main thing is that people learning to to listen to their nervous system. To tune in, sort of, yeah. To listen to it. We have not learned to listen to, our, to the body, to the intelligence of the nervous system, the intelligence of the body, to all the things, you know, every, to all the tightening, to li really listen what, what the system tells us. You know, there's such a high intelligence in our system that communicates with us, but we have not learned to receive this information because we are tending to interpret that information. It can be either psychologically, but it can also be spirituality. Like one interpretation is, it's just not real. Why should I deal with this? It's an interpretation. Yeah. Is that it is an interpretation as if I say, just focus on it all the time and try to fix it. It's a psychological interpretation. But can we really listen to and receive the information of what our system tells us, like, without a filter? And that, and so the, pre, the preoccupation for all this is that you know that there's awareness, and only that enables you to finally at least beginning to listen. And, I mean, there are meditation practices who promote this, like Vipassana, Mm -hmm. The thing is that they, they do it with a particular focus. And I'm, I, w I would suggest to receive the information without a focus, without doing anything with it. It's, it's like literally learning to become passive. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine if I tell those guys in Afghanistan, hey, guys, just receiving what your body tells most of the people, they would never return to the battlefield. Because they, because <laughs> your body says don't go no, there. Because that it's it's pure violence. I mean, what they're doing to themselves is pure violence. So then they have the concept of duty and right and and all the stuff. Okay, that makes them maybe going back to the battlefield. But if they would just l learn to listen, nobody would ever go back on a battlefield. Yeah, it's because it's pure violence against your own being. Mm -hmm. And no, no matter what what philosophy you're using to justify this, or whatever politics you're using for this, that is, that is it's 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 not case. So, I mean, it's easier said than done. Yeah. Or easier said than 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 say played with in daily life. 
And well, let, let's say a person says, okay, this sounds good. You know, I want to learn to listen to what's my, what my body and, and so on. And I'll, I'll devote whatever time it, you recommend, 15 minutes, half an hour, or, or little moments throughout the day or whatever. You know, what, what specifically, practically would you prescribe to such a person who, who could just start doing this on a daily basis? Very simple. Uh -huh. Every time you, you're noticing that you're disembodying, which means that you're losing ground, simply that you're losing ground contact, that you stop feeling yourself properly, take a moment. Take two, three, four, five seconds. That's enough. Mm. And bring your attention back to your nervous system. Just feel it, feel the vibration. Feel where it's comfortable, where it's not comfortable. Feel your feet on the ground. Take a breath and then move on. And it may be only lasting for 60 seconds until you feel like you're disembodying again. <laughs> Start again. Yeah. And it's like you're learning to walk. It becomes I mean, a habit it, after a while, maybe. You, you have to, because disembodying means not paying attention, jumping over, denying is a habit. Yeah. And it is even a spiritually justified habit. It became a spiritually justified habit. So in another way, through repetition, this habit becomes like your reality. And all what I'm introducing is giving that habit little interruptions mm -hmm. and double check with your system, are you, am I really here? Am I in touch with, I mean, am I, I, I normally spoken, I, do I have my feet on the ground basically? I mean, that's where it all begins. Do I really have my feet on the ground? Am, am I just flying high? And when I fly high, I don't feel much. So and then take a moment. And this is like an ongoing little, let's call it a play, a game, like a, you, you start to pay attention to yourself, which is for me the practical aspect of giving love or attention to yourself. Like, not here, not with your head, and I love myself, not as a suggestion or like an affirmation, but you really take a break and say, how, how is the system right now? Is it, I mean, is it well, or am I claiming that it is well? Mm. Yeah, so and in other words, just be a little bit more self-aware uh, and aw on a physical level, just be sort of tune, just tune in period listen periodically. Listen yeah, listen. it's not so much observing; it's not observing yourself. It's also not being aware of self. I would say it's like the the awareness, the focus of of awareness or the focus of attention just includes the body mm -hmm. and receives information that, in my experience, is essential to live a healthy life or an integrated life. A spiritual yeah. life is not necessarily an integrated life. Mm. Well, so, ideally it should be, but uh, often it isn't. Yeah, and, and integration doesn't mean like it's not a big, big, big super word. It's for me like, I mean, basically that you know how to make your living, that you have somehow intact relationships. If you're lucky, you have a partner you can explore with. I mean, these basics that you feel comfortable, that you feel like safe, without being completely neurotic and spiritualizing your own dis detachment because you don't know how to live. I mean, this is simple science of, of an integrated human being. Mm -hmm. It's not that you have to be Superman or go out and teach all kinds of stuff. That's bullshit, sorry to say. That just has nothing to do with integration. Mm -hmm. It's just like really very ordinary. And I'm, I'm just taking care of this in my own life as good as I can. And I, I'm noticing when my wife and me bump into each other, there's always an invitation to have a closer look what, what, what's, what's there and, and all that stuff. Then, then life becomes very simple and very easy. You're not, and there's no need to use anything to, to move away from that. You know, mm. it's, it's, this is, it's not necessary. You don't yeah. even talk about it, actually. Huh. You drink life just the way it, it, it comes in, to the, way, to the degree you can. And that's yeah. important to the degree your nervous system already allows that. Hmm. That's that's a, that's a key for me because I was trying. I was so frustrated sometimes that that I wanted to to really let it all in, but the system said I can't because yeah. there was still so much overwhelming me that even certain experiences were just too much. So it was like a battlefield inside of me, of my heart telling me, of course I like to open up, I like to be one, and I like to drink all of it, and the nervous system say, baby, slow down, this is too fast for me. Mm -hmm. And to bring this into an alignment in a way that really works, whew, that is a year-long process. And have you found, though, that over the years, your capacity to, to take it all in has continued to increase? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's like, like it, it, it's like a, a humbling process.
-hmm. of knowing that your energy is not unlimited, your adrenaline is not there forever, mm -hmm. that you're somehow, from a perspective of a man, I would say, that you're starting to honor more female uh, virtues. Mm -hmm. It's like the, it's like more receptivity, like not like, bah, like, like this kind <laughs> of style. Yeah. And I, I like the, what the Dalai Lama said on a, on a beautiful speech, I think last year, and I, I, it's not that, and I, I really like that he said, what the world needs the most is female moderation. Moderation? Female moderation. Uh huh, yeah. And I think we're on a journey there that including us as men, not becoming men, women, not becoming whims, right. but that we learn to pay attention to life in a way that a, a, a woman or a mother would always do because she's dealing with life in a different way with the body. And so I think we are on a journey from from this kind of masculine approach more to feminine qualities. Mm -hmm. And even our spirituality, I think, is going to change because if you look at Advaita, it's a pretty male-dominant uh, 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 philosophy, a right. field. And that's why I think that the whole issue of integrating, giving time, tuning in is, is a lot of headroom for, let's say, maturity even around this and I think Advaita is not the end of the line it is it, it was it is a suggestion it is 2,000 5,000 year old and it is still evolving yeah I mean consciousness evolving is not a fixed position which is claimed unfortunately often it is a, it is a movement it is an ongoing revealing that is happening through us as we're talking right now Advaita discovers itself in its deeper uh, 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 truth and I think if we see it like this then we really start to explore instead of claiming and, and exchanging opinions about what's right and wrong I mean that's my point I don't know yeah that's a good point um, let's touch on one more uh, theme if we have a moment um, that I heard you discuss a bit in your talks with Richard uh, never not here uh, you talked quite a bit about beliefs and belief systems and um, the impact that I suppose harboring certain unexamined assumptions has on a person's life. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. yes. Yeah. You want, want to just kind of address that for a minute? Yeah. I mean, if, if we talk about belief systems, we there are basically compensation organizations that make us not dealing with experiences that are incredibly painful in our nervous system and we don't know how to meet them. So when the system is has been under an impact of a painful experience or of an in invasion, the system, which is mostly connected with a life-threatening moment, what happens is that the system needs to survive that situation and it starts in that, in that in energetic impact, what happens that the system builds up rudimentary beliefs around life. For example, mm -hmm. Um, I can never trust, like for example, when your mother was inv invasive, the system learns I cannot trust closeness, I cannot trust intimacy, or I cannot trust a woman, mm. because th it is because that belief is connected with an inv invasive experience. Okay, mm -hmm. so later, so the system builds up a, 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 a belief. It's very very simple. I cannot trust a woman, for example. I just as a, as a, right, and that belief protects you from the repetition of another painful experience. So beliefs are subtle protection mechanisms that prevent the system of re-experiencing something that it didn't know how to cope with. Very simple. How they manifest in the body is through contractions. So every contraction we have is an unconscious belief that the body holds tight to it. So like, I can't, or I must, or it's impossible, or I know it's true. You know, these are like, like beliefs and all these rigid positions, another way to say, make the system make, f pull the focus tight, huh? rigid, in a, into a rigid focus, and, and the body follows the focus, as we found out, it tightens up. So mm -hmm. we feel these unconscious beliefs or rigid positions as all kinds of tension in the somatic, in the somatic organization, like in the tissue, in the muscles, and no, solving it on the mental, trying to find that um, uh, belief, 
doesn't actually make a big difference. I mean, psychology has tried a lot of stuff like this. And I mean, Byron Katie, she's doing a lot of stuff with this kind of turnarounds, changing belief systems. I mean, mm -hmm. it has a beautiful value, but only when we give the body time to drink that, to, 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 to see the correlation between the, the, the muscular structure, the tissue, the cells, and how the psyche, I believe is a psychological organization, how they're correlating all the time. Um, so through changing belief system, it's not necessarily that the cell starts to relax. It has an effect, but it's like, like a dynamic. I would say it's like, a, like an information exchange from the cells to the, to the mental realm, to the psyche, and back to the cells. So what's, what was very useful for me is to understand that these beliefs or positions are protection mechanisms. Hmm. They, they are survival mechanisms of the system. In, order to cope with certain experience where it doesn't know how to cope with naturally, like in, in, in an appropriate way, for example. Hmm. Does this make sense? Yeah. In fact, uh, f funny, when you were saying that, I was reminded of the lyrics of uh, I Am A Rock by Simon and Garfunkel. You know, mm. a rock feels no pain, an island never dies, I touch no one and no one touches me. You know, <laughs> very appropriate song. So how did you, uh, you know, with this understanding, how did, did that enable you to kind of unravel beliefs that you were using as protective mechanisms or somehow relax them or something? No, I mean, it's a, like, 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 again, a very practical example, you know, like I'm a married man, mm -hmm. I love my wife, and from time to time we're getting into trouble, huh? mm -hmm. like everybody, okay? So sure. there's a dynamic happening, and in the moment, what, what everybody can notice that the trouble begins, that my system loses its sense of ease and, and, and rest, and it becomes activated. Hmm? Mm. I call it an activation. And a slight leap, like I, I'm not resting in my body, I become like a speed in the system, okay? Like fear, all kinds of stuff. We don't have to label that all stuff. Yeah. And, and, and with, that, with that sense of losing rest, there are interesting movements happening, defensive movements, protective movements, like fight, fight, flight, and freeze. Huh? We were right. talking about this, okay? And just mm -hmm. to realize this and to take a moment to really see how the system has moved from ease to an habit to defend. Agitation, yeah. Yeah, an activation. Like it's an activation. Right. It, in that moment when you're not moving with the psychology, because normally when the energy starts to disembody, what happens? It pushes the energy up into your head, and the head and the mind starts to be activated too. You start to think more than you before, because when you're resting, there's not much thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the mind starts to try to find the cause of the difficulty. Now, is it she? No, it's me. No, there's something. What has happened? You know. And in these when you take time to examine that, to really see without following anything, not the sensations, not the thinking, you would see that there are a few, <laughs> I mean, funny enough, it's a few musts, don'ts, have to, huh. no-nos, absolutes, that show up. absolutes right. that show up. And all this stuff, I mean, all I'm doing is just I'm asking myself, is it necessary? Yeah. I mean, it's all, okay, I can protect, and it's nothing wrong to protect, and it's nothing wrong to defend, but is it useful, is it necessary in this moment to, to meet or to solve? And funny enough, it's, I never found it necessary. Hmm. So in that moment, it's not necessary. It's, again, it's not no, it's not pushing it away or suppressing it. It's just, I can do this now. I can keep on, but is it necessary? What's the what's the function of, of it? You know. If so I'm recognizing that you can kind of relax out of it and not. Yeah, not because persist it's not necessary. In, yeah. Exactly, you're not moving with the with the with the with the with the fight, flight, and freeze defenses. Yeah, you kind know? of it's step not back. And... It's like yeah, it's you you give it space. It's not so much detaching yourself because it's not so much withdrawing or stepping back. It's more suddenly there are options. Hmm that they were not, not there before. Be, because if this is, remains unconscious and not, in, like not seen, there's no option. There's nothing we can do. The habit kicks in and it moves us no matter how conscious we are. We're even seeing that we're moving with the habit. We're even conscious of this, but there is no other option. The system just m moves habitually. Yeah. yeah. But, so th th that's, that's important to notice that we can be fully conscious of an habitual functioning we are conscious of it, but as the system has no other option, there is only one option, which means 
keep on repeating pain patterns or mm-hmm. or or destructive patterns that we know they're not working and we can even say I'm I'm a fully aware of this but that doesn't change anything mm-hmm. and to not justify this and not using anything there's an interest at least in my system to see okay what are, is the, is there an option or is there freedom of choice mm-hmm. because as long as and we have to also clarify this as long as unconscious habits are playing out there's absolutely no option for us mm. like we cannot do anything and the moment you're aware of and the system has taken a moment like to really tune in and to see what is happening options arise mm. there's a, it's like it's like a space like a gap mm. in which a moment of freedom is like it's like space and in that space options arise alternatives Mm -hmm. and for me freedom is nothing else but having options to my habitual functioning that's freedom Hmm. I'm free yeah that's all what it is that I have options that I can experiment it doesn't it's not a guarantee it's gonna move on nicely it's not a guarantee that it's moving perfectly in the next step but at least I'm not going down the old highway which is just repeating and establishing Tr- beliefs into deeper truths, so to say. Okay, and 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 that's very practical for me and my relationship or my my all the things that they are a perfect playground for me to exactly play with that stuff. Mm-hmm. Is there an option? That sounds great. Good. So there is there is options when we are conscious, as long mm-hmm. as we're unconscious, and we're even using a philosophy to. To, to to cover that up, it's true. There's nothing we can do. But in the moment we are conscious, there are options. Yeah, I'm reminded of what Christ said as they were about to crucify him. He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're unconscious. They're unconscious. Yeah. But so we have to see it from, we can look at reality and at life through two, two different perspectives, from the perspective of unconscious pa- patterns that play out, which means unconscious means we don't see them Mm -hmm. we we are we don't even know that they are operating and from that of course we cannot do anything right so it's even true when people say there's nothing you can do but only from the perspective of unconscious habits playing out and I would not claim that even in this moment there might not might not be even some unconscious patterns playing out but as long as I don't see them there's nothing I can do yeah but in the moment I'm conscious of them no matter how it come along options show up mm-hmm. say hey I can experiment with this I can try it another way I can play it I can dance you know it's like suddenly you have two steps before you had one step now you have like three two four steps and say hey wow that's cool it, that is smooth isn't it yeah well, that's good and I think it, I guess whatever everything you've said today it seems to me it boils down to culturing the habit of self-referral or self you know tuning into your uh, to your not, body, no? not to not just simply not denying anything, not denying and and culturing the habit of sort of just stopping the habitual drive outward yes. and just to, to, uh, turn within for a moment and take a moment, see what's take, going on. Yes, just taking a moment, two, three, four, five seconds, mm-hmm. tuning into the, the the nervous system, into the habit habits because you know yourself already. You yeah. have lived with yourself for six, 62 years. You know <laughs> all your habits and. And it just takes one moment to say, okay, I, I, whoa, 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 wait a second, I know this now. I know the whole story. And what that happens when I give a moment of gentle, 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 gentle quality of attention to, to some maybe valuable information that my body wants to give me, and I just couldn't hear it up to yeah. now. I could just, no way, it's no. <laughs> That's how we mostly are. Don't, don't talk to me like this. <laughs> Very That's funny. Good. It's it's. I mean, it's so funny how we're functioning. Yeah, it's like the old saying: "Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind." <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, like because the body tells you some facts yeah. that may interfere with the truth of your mind, mm. and to bring them together, that I, I would describe it as like an integrated human being or the capacity to enjoy. Even when life comes in, and life is not always pleasant, it's it cannot be. Right. It's a it's it's a lollipop fantasy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lovely. 
Great. Well, thank you very much, Florian. This I think this gives people a lot to chew on. And, uh, <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. And um, if they want to chew more, I'll be linking to your website, and they can read uh, things and listen to things and even talk to you in person over Skype uh, if they'd like yeah, to do that. Cool. So I, I'm sure this I'm I, I'll be coming if, if nothing happens uh, unexpectedly. I'll be back in, 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 in the States. It's uh, uh, soon for like starting in Seattle and then on sand again on that conference mm -hmm. in San Rafael and then just traveling around in the U.S. and having a final like a finalizing retreat in Florida in I think around mid to November. So, so because I, I I can imagine that quite a few people in the states listen to your programs. Yeah, yeah, quite a few all over the world actually, and ah. uh, and you'll have a schedule of all that on your website I presume. Yeah. There will be a new website coming out in the next few weeks, so it's still the old website, but it provides all the necessary Redesigned and all, yeah. Yeah, it's the whole relaunch of the whole thing, and uh, I, I would be lovely to, to also link that video once you put it on your website, maybe. I yeah, absolutely. To put it on, the new, on my website, so. It's easy to do. Your, your webmaster will know how to do it. You, you embed the code, and it just okay, shows good. up. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, thanks. Let me just make some uh, points in summary. Um, I've been speaking with Florian Schlosser, um, and this is, I don't know, number 87 or 88 or something in a series of interviews that I've been doing on a show called Buddha at the Gas Pump. I do a new one each week. And uh, if you go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, you'll see the whole collection. Uh, you can subscribe to an email newsletter to be notified when new ones are posted. And you can subscribe to a podcast if you like to listen while you're commuting or something like that. Um, there's discussion groups that pop up with each new interview. There's a, it's like a place to leave comments and people often get into lively discussions. And sometimes I'll even call the author in or the, 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 the person I've interviewed to comment on questions people have asked and so on. Um, so batgap.com, please visit there. My next interview will be with Karen Richards, who's in the UK, and you'll notice that she'll be wearing the same headset as Florian. <laughs> <laughs> I have several of them out in the field, and people send them one to the next. So thanks for watching or listening, and we'll see you next week. Okay, thank you, Rick, for inviting me, and uh, love and hugs to you and to everyone who was, who was going to listen to this. Thanks, and uh, I look forward to meeting you in California. Oh yeah, you'll be on the conference. You said. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. I'm happy to. I'm happy. To. I'll be having a, a pre-conference uh, workshop, and then like all the like the other people, like a presentation. I don't know exactly. It's mm -hmm. it's a fun. It's a fun happening. A lot of information. Uh, yeah. Last year was interesting because I felt like people didn't really take a lot of time to integrate what came into them. So after the end of the at the end of the day the people were so in their heads <laughs> there was so much information coming in and they didn't there was no reason really rushing from one event to the other. So um, yeah. to ha yeah. this time I took myself also two more days to oh, good. to slow down and not to rush through the whole thing. Yeah, and uh, incidentally, if people are interested in that conference, there's a link on my website to it. There's an icon that on the right-hand oh, side. Oh, the dog is getting excited. Um, there's a link on the right-hand side, which is science and non-duality. If you click on that, it'll take you to the site where you can uh, see more about that if you want. And I would so, recommend yeah. also that it's, uh, people come because it's a great event. A lot of different voices, a lot of different energies and tastes that people can play with. So I'm looking forward to be back. So yeah, I put it on our website too and my, on Facebook good. too. A lot of the people I've been interviewing will be there. In fact, that's part of the reason I want to go. I mean, um, Benito Massaro and Pamela Wilson and all kinds of people, um, and also people I'm going to be interviewing like Rupert Spira and, and others. So um, anyway. I guess we plugged that conference enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Florian. Uh, Rick, really appreciate it. Pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, I'll see you soon.